Hi, this is Dave Utter, and we're continuing with our uh, studies in the book of Romans. This is our second uh, study in the book of Romans for the Adult Bible Fellowship class at South County Bible Church. You're welcome to join us in person if you're able to after the morning service every Sunday morning at South County Bible Church. You know, if you're not able to, uh, perhaps uh, seeing this online will be something you want to do and to keep up with. We started last week with the general idea of Romans, the theme establishing God's righteousness and how we can be right with God. Another way to say how can we, be, we can be justified. What is the gospel all about? How are we saved? Now we're going to pick up where we left off around verse 7. Now verse 7, Paul says, he's writing to, to he identifies the people to whom he's writing. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So to whom is he writing? Well, obviously the people in Rome. We believe that at this point, Paul had never been there. He had not met the people there in Rome, but he was writing to them. He knew that the gospel had reached there. There was a body of believers there. Now notice in verse seven, what are the two identifiers of the people in Rome, the believers? What does it say about them? Those who in Rome who are what? Well, it says, first of all, they're loved by God, and they're called to be saints. Loved by God. And we could take really a lot of time and just go off and talk about that doctrine of God's love. How amazing it is that we sinners, and as we're going to see so clearly in the book of Romans, people who are totally incapable of pleasing God in ourselves. In Romans chapter 8, Paul is going to say, so those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Impossible. And yet God loves us. When the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, it wasn't he loved the world because the world was so lovable. In fact, it had been rebellion, rebellious against God. People choosing their own way as opposed to God's way, but God still loved us. The amazing love of God that sent Christ to the cross to pay for us. And then what's the second thing it says here? Called to be saints. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be called to be saints? Well, this word is it's an interesting word. We could look at it in a couple of different ways. Uh, the word saints comes from a root word. It's the same idea as being holy. So called to be holy people, to be called right with God. Now, when you look at scripture about Christians being called saints, there are two aspects of it. Sometimes the Bible talks about us being, and we'll call it saints positionally. In Acts chapter 9, in verse 13, it talks about Paul, then he was called Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting the saints that were at Jerusalem, the believers, the Christians. But it calls them saints. It doesn't say people who were trying to become saints. It says the people who were. In the beginning of Philippians, Paul writes to the people at Philippi and says, I'm writing to the saints who are at Philippi. So there's one sense in which when we're saved in God's sight, we are holy, we are saints. But there's another sense in which we are not yet, and we call that saints practically. And right here, verse 7 of chapter 1, we're called to be saints. Uh, this little slide is someone something I found on the internet that somebody else wrote, but I thought I put it well. God secured the Christian's personal holiness through the death, death of his son and also began holiness at the practical level. When Christ died for us, judicially before God, he took Jesus' righteousness and put it in our account. So when God looks at us and sees us, what does he see? No sin, perfect righteousness. We are totally forgiven once for all and forever. However, that is in our judicial relationship with God. Practically speaking, or we could say relationship-wise speaking, like a father and a son, although we will always be God's child, we will not necessarily always be in good fellowship with him because sin can hurt that. That's why we have, like 1 John chapter 1, and verse 9, when we sin, we need to confess our sin. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So we are once for all forgiven before God, but as we walk in this life, 
in a practical way, we're becoming, hopefully, more and more holy. So Paul says to you, Roman people, you are called to be something. God has a desire for each of his children. When God saves us, God doesn't just say, okay, gotcha, here's your ticket into heaven, that's done, go on. No, God has a, a, a purpose for us, to be like his son. We're going to see that later in Romans as well. God desires for us to be like him. And of course, that makes sense. Wouldn't you want to be the very best you could be? Perfect. Jesus Christ was perfect. God's goal for us is perfection. We'll never achieve that, achieve that perfection in this life. But we are on that road toward it, something that God begins in us. Another way to look at it is like this. At the time of salvation, we are declared to be saints. We're declared to be righteous. Now, salvation happens at a point in time. It's not something that you gradually work yourself into because it is the act of God where he converts us. Sometimes we use the word conversion, justifies us. We are born again, born from above. He gives us the new birth. So it's something that God does to us when he sees that we are truly repentant of our sins and that we are trusting in or relying on the death of Christ to be our redemption, to pay the just penalty for all of our sins. When that happens, it happens instantaneous. It is, there is a point in time. We may not even always be able to really identify that. Some people can't, some people can't. But salvation is a point in time we are justified. But then we are becoming saints, which is working on becoming more righteous through a growth. It's a process, and we call that sanctification. Some people grew up in churches where they believe that there are certain saints that help you with things and you can pray to. That is never in the Bible. That idea is that certain people were so good or so holy that they had extra, extra grace, extra help that they can give to others and you, therefore you can pray to them. No, we pray only to God. We pray to Jesus Christ, to God. Um, and we are all, all believers, are saints with God, before God, and we're called to be saints. I like 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2 because Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he uses the word for both aspects of being saints or sanctified in the same verse. He says, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. And the Greek word there is the same underlying Greek word. You could say, to those who are sainted in Christ Jesus, but called to be saints. And that's a neat way of putting it there, because Paul is saying, before Christ, we're made to be right with God by his grace. Before God, because of what Christ has done, all of us, no matter whether we were terrible sinners, as we might want to term it, or minor sinners, or whatever you know, degree of sin you might think of yourself in, all of us are totally guilty. All of us are under God's wrath. We're going to see that today in Romans chapter 1. But by the work of Christ, he has made us, he has paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future, made us right in the sight of God. But as we live in this world, we still have part of our old sin nature, and we need to be walking forward and getting victory over that. Now, to, who, to whom was Paul writing the gospel? People at Rome. Unsaved or saved? Saved. Christians in the, the church, the group that was at Rome. So why is Paul writing about the gospel to people who are already saved, already knew the gospel? Why is it important for believers to know the details about the gospel and about God's righteousness? Well, it helps to make sure that we understand it properly, that we don't deceive ourselves thinking we might be Christians or good enough and we're really not. How many people are in Christian or in various churches? And they think they're right with God. Perhaps they have really given of their lives. Perhaps they have really uh, been generous with their means and self-sacrificing to serve God and to serve others. But does that mean they're saved or not? One of the saddest verses is toward the end of Matthew chapter 7, where Paul says, people will come before me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done many, many great works in your name? We've shared the gospel. We've done this and that. They expected they really believed that they were going to get into, into heaven. And then Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Wow. 
to go through your whole life thinking you had it right and then to find out you don't. That's really serious. That's really sad. So it was important to make sure we don't deceive ourselves. We need to make sure we understand the gospel. And then another reason is to have a greater understanding of God and his work and therefore more glory to him and more praise for his grace. And then Paul ends that verse, verse 7. He says, grace to you and peace. He does this in most of his letters. He says, grace to you and peace. Uh, why? Why do we need grace and peace? Well, what is grace? In salvation and justification, we say, well, grace is God's giving me what I don't deserve, the salvation, the forgiveness. Uh, but for Christians who are, are saved, what does the Bible mean when God gives us enough grace, like with Paul? And he asked three times for the thorn in the flesh to depart, and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. What does that mean? For believers, God's grace is that enabling that God gives us to do what we need to do, what we ought to do. So Paul prays, I pray that God, I desire that you'll have God's grace, that you will have God's enabling every day to have courage, to have victory over sin, to understand your forgiveness, to live a life of kindness. May God grant you the enabling to live as you ought to live. And peace, peace from God on a daily basis. Now, as we go into the next section, verses 8 to 15, we're looking at the nature of the relationship between those who are justified, and that would be Paul and the people that he's writing to. Notice in verse 8, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. What was Paul's relationship with his people? What is, was his thinking toward them? What did he want to see happen there? Well, first of all, he says right at the beginning of verse 8, what does he do? I what? I thank God for you. He expresses a believer in his relationship with other believers should be thankful for them and express that thanks. How many times do you and I go up to another fellow believer, fellow Christian and say, you know, I thank the Lord for you. And the second thing, and I want you to know that I pray for you. Paul says that here in most of his letters. I pray for you regularly. I thank God for you. I'm praying for you. And then thirdly, Paul says, I want to be with you. I desire your fellowship, be around you. And fourthly, and this is interesting, acknowledge the mutual help. In verse 11, Paul says, I long to see you. I want to be around you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. I hope I can help you by my teaching. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith, both yours and mine. And so Paul writes to them and says, you know, I, I think I can help you, but you know what, folks, you can help me. Now, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, writer of many books of the New Testament, writing to these evidently newer believers in Rome. And what does Paul say? You can help me, I can help you. And that, that is a neat thing to see, that in Christ there is that unity that we can and need. We all need each other. We're all part of the body, none of us more than the other. And he goes on and it fleshes that out in the next few verses through verse 15. But looking down at verses 16 and 17, and this is kind of a powerful end to his introduction to the gospel, uh, where he says, God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel. Verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek? In what way does the gospel demonstrate the power of God? Well, it does something that we could never do. We are totally unable to save ourselves. Uh, we also see the power of God in the way that it changes people's lives. The gospel should change our lives. In some people, it is more obvious of a change than others, but with all of us, we need change from living self-righteously and for ourselves to living for God. There are instances, stories in the Bible, as well as around us every day, of people's lives that God has supernaturally changed. He has the power to do it. We don't. So the gospel is nothing to be ashamed of because it's powerful. It can change people. It can save people. It shows what God can do. 
But then he says in verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Very famous verse, which is quoted from the Old Testament and comes up here a lot of times in the, in the New Testament. In what way does the gospel reveal the righteousness of God? In the picture there on the screen, as uh, Martin Luther done and the Lord left, nailing the 95 Thesis to the uh, door of the Church of Wittenberg there in Germany. And that famous phrase, the grass and the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, Martin Luther used to say he, he was angry with God. Because he says, why would God do this? He, he demands perfection and holiness and right of God to do so. Um, but I can't do it. And so I'm frustrated. God keeps telling me I need to, but then I try, 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 and I can't make it. And, and Martin Luther tried really, really hard, if you know about his life. But he was always frustrated because he couldn't be good enough. And one day after studying, he became a teacher and studying Romans and Galatians and Psalms. He came across the phrase, the just shall live, or the righteous shall live by faith. And studying realized, yes, God tells us we have to be right with him. And we can't be. But that helps us to realize our inability, to realize that there's nothing we can do and to lean wholly on him in having faith, the just, the righteous, the way we live, the way we're sanctified, the way, excuse me, the way we're justified is by faith, trusting in Christ. And that's what the gospel, and then Luther was excited in the beginning of what we call the modern, the Reformation, the grace, salvation by grace through faith. God saves people, not by people keeping a bunch of laws or works or rituals. God saves us because Christ paid for our sin. And when we want to turn from our sin, when we're sorry for our sin, want the change. And when we come to rely on what Christ did for us, we trust in that to be what saves us. We don't trust in our religious ritual. We don't trust in our good efforts. We trust only what Christ has done for us. God sees that faith and he reckons or imputes it, counts it toward us to be righteousness, to make us right. So the gospel shows that God is right. God is holy. And just like a, a judge who is a just, proper judge, he can't just let people go. If a person is, is guilty, he can't let them go with no sentence, with no punishment. If he did, we would say that's not a good judge. God is holy and just. And so those who sin, all of us, have to have the punishment. Well, just like the verse we looked at last week from Psalms, mercy and truth have kissed each other, how can do God do that? How can God still be right, righteous, and save us when he's supposed to be judging us, sending us to hell? How can he do that? The gospel shows that God is right in saving us because sin was paid for through Christ. So these great verses in verses 16 and 17. Now let's get into the first real section. All the first 17 verses were actually introduction to the book. The first major section, the guilt and just condemnation of the non-religious, verses 18 to 32. And our first question we have to ask is, does God get angry with people? Look at verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Does God get angry with people? Uh, he does. Is God loving? Totally, uh, way beyond we can ever imagine. But although God is perfectly loving to every single single one of his creation, creatures, he also gets angry with them because of sin. Psalm 7, verse 11, God is angry with the wicked every day. John 3, 36, to those who believe in the Son, they have life. To those who don't believe in the Son, the wrath of God abides on them. Revelation 14, 10, similar. God's anger, God's wrath, what's meant by that? Well, this is divine and right displeasure against sin. It's a lot different from our anger. Why do we usually get angry when we get anger, angry? Usually it's because we don't get what we want. We don't like something. Something's not going our way or the way we think it should be, so we get angry. That's not God's anger. God has a, a true divine displeasure against sin versus man's anger, which is normally self-centered. So the verse starts out, God is angry with man. And that's going to be setting up the need for the gospel. Why is the gospel so necessary? Why are we talking about God's righteousness here? 
because God is justly angry with man. Why is God angry? Well, it says in this verse, man suppresses the truth. Man uh, holds it down. Man knows about it, but doesn't do it. He knows what's right, but he refuses to do it. He either just ignores it or makes excuses, justifies what he wants to do. Oh, it's okay if I take this item from work because, you know, they don't pay enough. My, my job doesn't pay me enough anyway. They don't treat me well enough. And so if I toll for, take some of these things home, it's not really so bad. Well, he's mean to me and I need to teach him a lesson. That's why I treat him that way. Give him the silent treatment or argue, argue with him. Or, well, I deserve to enjoy myself. I'll be happier, like Adam and Eve thought. I'll be happier to do things my way than God's way. It's better off. Or the fool has said in his heart, Romans, or excuse me, Psalm 14, 1. There is no God. So people know the truth, but they suppress it. Our problem isn't lack of knowledge, but rather an unwillingness to submit to God. You know, you think about it, we're all from, obviously, Adam and Eve, but even narrowing it down further, we're all from Noah and his family. And at one time, when Noah and his family, you know, they came off the ark, everybody in the earth, it was only eight people, but everybody in the earth knew about God very well. Somewhere in the ensuing generation, whether it was one generation or 10, I don't know, somewhere after that, people who did know, they, they guarantee they knew about God because everybody in the beginning did, made the choice to not worship and follow God. And that affected everybody after them. Oh, well, that's not fair. We talk about what's fair and, and what's not fair. But we have to understand the way the world is set up is that sometimes we we suffer for other people's actions. Uh, you know, this whole section we're talk we're going to answer the question: What about people in the world who never heard the gospel? Will they be going to hell even though they never heard the gospel, never had a chance, so to speak? Is it fair? Um, you think about a man who is, uh, commits a crime and is put in jail. I'm an interpreter. I interpret for people in court settings. So a man is put in jail, he's got kids. Uh, will his kids suffer? Will there be negative repercussions for his kids because of what the dad has done? Yes. Is it their fault? No. Is it fair? No. But it happened. That's the way things are set up. The president of your country, um, well, his decisions, our, our local our senators, the people that we have over us, they make decisions we may or may not agree with. They affect us. Yep. Not always fair. But we also have to look at the flip side of this. Jesus obeyed perfectly. He did all that was right. Is it fair? Is it right for his goodness to be attributed to us, for us to have advantage from what he did right? No, that's not fair. So we really shouldn't talk about what's being fair. We should talk about what God does here. And why doesn't man have an excuse? Well, look at verses 19 and 20. Here's the answer, verse, verse 19, 4, but here's the, because what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. How? In the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. They're without excuse because God has made some of his invisible attrib attributes clear. Which ones? Well, it says here his eternal power and his deity, his divine nature. In other words, and, and how does this happen? It says through creation. By people just studying and looking at what God has made, they should be able to understand there's a creator, there's a designer. You go down the road in a place you've never been before, you see a garden laid out, nice rows on the side of the road, you have no idea whose property that is. You have no idea who made that garden. But you believe something. You believe that somebody made that garden. You don't believe it happened by random. You see a picture on the wall in somebody's house. You don't think that that picture just happened by random. You believe someone designed, purpose, made it there. Uh, we talk with people who, who believe in evolution. And I've talked to people, where, where did things start? If you believe in a Big Bang or something else, where was the very, very beginning that evolved? I don't know. One evolutionist talking to me said, well, maybe energy is eternal. That doesn't sound very scientific. Maybe energy is eternal. That's not very scientific. 
or, you know, where is all the proof of these things? You study the complex. And in Psalm 19, 1 and 2, the heavens declare the glory of God. Even the people back uh, in Jesus' time, not having telescopes and, or microscopes and those things, but they were great observers of, of things around them. They, they didn't have uh, electricity. They didn't have the internet, TV to watch at night. Looking at the stars, noticing that the planets uh, move differently from the stars. The word translated planet comes from a word meaning wandering because they noticed that the main group of stars, they followed a certain track across the night sky, but there were these certain dots of light, which we now know are planets, which didn't track with the others. They had different patterns. And just as, as, as much as they knew, as much as we know, God's glory, God's handiwork. Think of the billions of stars they are out there. The billions of galaxies with the billions of stars in each. It is mind boggling. Then you think about tiny things, bacteria and biomes and uh, in the ways our body are made. God, God said, we're without excuse because everybody in the world, even though they've never heard about Jesus, they've never heard about everything else, everybody in the world should be able to understand if they were to really look around them about God's creation. They're going to understand who God is. There's a book, I think it's by a guy named Don Richardson, if I remember correctly, Eternity in Their Hearts. And he chronicles people groups around the world who did not have any gospel, any communication with outside tribes or whatever, but in their world history, perhaps, they had a story about someone coming to share about the true God who made everything. Uh, and it's interesting to hear how God works. Um, God makes himself known, and people are without excuse because if they really think about it, they know there is a God. And even the idea of a right and wrong, where did that come from? Every people group in the world has a set of rights and wrongs. And they know that killing is wrong in various things. Where did that come from? God put it in our hearts. In Ecclesiastes, it says, God put eternity in our hearts. So we have these two things. We call them natural or general revelation, which is the creation all around us. And then special revelation, which is the word of God, the, the gospel. We need the special revelation so we would understand uh, the details that Christ came to die for our sin. But even the natural gener general revelation, God has made these things known to us so that we would really understand that there is a God and that he is incredibly powerful. Maybe at that point, we don't know much about him. We don't know that he has a son, Christ. We don't know any of that, but we know God. And uh, God works in people's hearts, and God is powerful. When people do seek him, God is able to make himself known to them in the ways that they need to know, for God is love. So God says, people are all ex without excuse. God is angry with man because man knew about God. And there's, since the beginning of creation, there's lots of evidence that there is a God. But man chooses to ignore it. And it's very interesting, I think, with many people who do not believe in creation, uh, they hold to a certain theory, and then after so many years, certain aspects of that theory are disproved, you know, they, they come to another one. They keep jumping from a theory to a theory to a theory, not based on facts. A lot of times, it seems like the real issue is they don't want to believe there is a God, because if they do, they have to submit themselves, themselves to his authority. So it's not so much facts and science, although they say it is, they use those terms, but it's not really. It's not, a, it's not observational science. It is rather what? It is rather choosing to believe what they want to believe. Now we're going to have to stop here and, and go on to the rest of this chapter and see how God works with the people. And if you look in the next several verses, especially starting in verse, um, verse 21 says, although they didn't know God and they didn't honor him, what happened? And then what did God do? Verse 24 and verse 26. And there's one more time it occurs. You'll see the same phrase happening over and over again. See if you can find that, that phrase. It happens three times. Uh, what was God's response to people when they knew what, 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 what was right, but they chose not to do it? God explains the consequences of when people reject him, even though they didn't know the gospel. All people are guilty. They sin against their conscience. They sin against 
uh, the, the knowledge that is there in natural revelation, and they just go downhill because they choose to. And therefore, God is justly angry with them. And then in chapter 2, we'll go on and see even the religious people, God is justly angry with them too, because they are all just as guilty. So we'll stop at this point. Read if you can. The rest of chapter 1 and into chapter 2 will follow for that next time. Thank you. Thank you.